Good morning, it's Friday, November the 4th, and I'm uh, Wimala, and I'm in Northern Illinois. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to start raining any minute now, and rain for the rest of the day, so our weather may be changing. It's still going to be warm, but we may, maybe it'll be cold by next week. Um, I still have squirrels just feasting and trying to get as big as they possibly can, so I know they're getting ready for winter. So we're still reading. Today I don't have to leave early, so we're reading from Pema Children's book, How We Live is How We Die. And this has been a great book. I'm enjoying reading it, and I hope you're enjoying uh, listening to it. And we're skip, I'm not skipping around, but I'm not reading every chapter because I want you to, I want you to enjoy this book again when you pick it up to read it. She's such a good teacher. Oh, so here's a good chapter. It looks like right now I'm kind of reading everything. But this is a chapter 11, Feel What You Feel. This is very important. Sometimes we try not to, not to feel what we feel. Feel what you feel. Is death an enemy or a friend? That, my dear, depends on you. It's a good quote. I saw this quote written on a wall in San Francisco and it stopped my mind. Of course, whether old age, illness, or death, or death, or our friends or enemies is entirely up to us. It all depends on how our mind is set. And to a large extent, it depends on how we work with our emotions. So how do you right now work with your emotions? This is worth looking into. Knowing how to work with our emotions is really the key to finding balance and equanimity, qualities that support us as we go forward through all the transitions and gaps that we are yet to experience. One of the most beautiful slogans from the popular Buddhist text, the seven points of mind training is drive all blames into one. When I began to study this slogan, I had a sense of the basic idea. It may seem like outer circumstances are provoking us and making us suffer, but the real culprit is always our own ego clinging. But for many years, I found it difficult to apply this teaching in a personal way. First of all, I wasn't quite sure what they meant by ego clinging. It seemed like an abstract concept and I didn't know how to relate to it to my own experience. I also had trouble with the idea of blame. To me, it sounded like I should blame myself, which was what I tended to do anyway. I knew that wasn't the intent of the teaching, but I wasn't sure how else to interpret it. And this is from the, the uh, The Seven Points of Mind Training, and Pema Children has a couple of books out about that, and also cards. I always one, I always keep one of her cards right next to my Buddha. Always, so this is a card I'm always trying to work with. Always maintain only a joyful mind. That's one of the fifty-seven, and then on the back of her card. It explain, gives a commentary for it. So mind that's always maintain only a joyful mind. The commentary is constantly apply cheerfulness if for no other reason than because you are on this spiritual path. Have a sense of gratitude to everything, even difficult emotions, because of their potential to wake you up. Oops. So... It's just, some people change these cards every day, and I've had mine up for a long time because it just keeps being perfect. Oh, 
I can't pronounce this name, I'm sorry, Daigar Kontrul Rinpoche, in which he used the phrase, the propensity to be bothered. <laughs> I like that. And something clicked for me. Though he wasn't speaking directly about drive all blames into one, I began to understand how this slogan is a teaching on propensities. That's what we talked about yesterday, those tendencies that we have. While ego clinging seemed abstract and conceptual, how we experience ego clinging, our propensities, was something I knew intimately on a daily basis. The slogan was encouraging me to recognize my propensities, my beautiful monsters, as the cause of unnecessary unhappiness. The Dharma tells us that all our experiences of discomfort anxiety, being disturbed, and being bothered are rooted in our kleshas. This Sanskrit term means destructive emotions or pain-causing emotions. The three main kleshas are craving, aggression, and ignorance. We call those two the, the uh, three poisons. Craving, aggression, and ignorance. The first two don't require much explanation. Craving becomes a destructive emotion when it gets to the point of being an addiction or an obsession. I was once given some Asian candy whose brand name was Baby Want Want. <laughs> that sums up craving quite nicely, I think. Baby Want Want. <laughs> We think something will bring us pleasure or comfort, so we become obsessed with having it or keeping it. Aggression is the opposite. We want to get rid of something that we perceive as a threat to our well-being. Ignorance as a destructive emotion is a little harder to understand. It's a dull, indifferent state of mind that actually contains a deep level of pain it can express itself as being out of touch, being mentally lethargic, not caring what we're feeling or what others are going through. When this state of mind dominates us, it can turn into depression. These three kleshas are often called the three poisons because as Anam Tubton says, they kill our happiness. This often happens to us in two ways. First, we suffer while we experience anger, addiction, depression, jealousy, and the rest. Then we continue to suffer as a result of the harmful actions they provoke. You probably have firsthand experience of being unhappy when, when these poisons arise. Let me read the sentence again, I'm stuttering. You probably have firsthand experience of being unhappy when these poisons arise in your life. But how exactly do they kill your happiness? According to the Buddha's teachings, it's not the emotions themselves that make us suffer. In their raw form, before we start to struggle with them, and before our thinking process gets involved, they are just sensations or forms of energy. They are not un intrinsically good or bad. I think that's um, really important to remember that in their raw form, before we start to struggle with them and before our thinking gets involved, they are just sensations or forms of energy. They are not intrinsically good or bad. This is important to remember the destructive aspect of aggression, for instance, is not the sensation. It's our rejection of that sensation and what we then do as a response. The culprit isn't the basic energy, but the spin-off, what the Buddhist teacher Sharon Salzberg calls, calls the add-ons. So remember that energy that, that arises before any action or any thought process. There's nothing uh, good or bad about that. 
that's that's normal that happens uh, but it becomes destruct destructive is what we is when we reject the sensation like we try to repress it or push it away and what we then do is a response Sharon Salzberg calls it the, the add-ons to that energy. When Klesha energy arises, we tend to react in one of a few ways. One is to act out, either physically or with our words. Another is to suppress the emotions, to go numb around it. This may involve diverting our attention elsewhere, say by zoning out with Netflix. A third common reaction is to get mentally wrapped up in some kind of storyline, one that often involves blame. All these reactions are based on our not being able to bear the discomfort of the energy. We have a propensity to be bothered by this energy, so we try to escape our discomfort by getting rid of what's causing it. This approach is similar to that of a tyrant who kills the messenger bringing bad news instead of relating to the message. But when we indulge in any of these reactions, we only strengthen our pain-causing habits and perpetuate our misery in the long run. Somehow this is a hard lesson to learn. Everyone has these habits. There's no need to blame ourselves or anyone else for this process. Instead of blaming or feeling helpless, we can apply time-tested methods for working with our emotions constructively. Like everything else in the universe, the clashes and our reactions to them are impermanent and insubstantial. This is what makes it possible for us to change our habits. Because even the reactions like everything else in the universe, the clashes and our reactions to them are impermanent and insubstantial because of that we can change them because they're not permanent. In general, lack of awareness is what gives our emotions their power. Bringing awareness to them is the magic key. When we're aware of what's happening, they love their ability to make us miserable. The first step in every method of working with emotions is simply to recognize what's happening. One of the characteristics of the klesha is that they tend to go undetected. We only notice them when they become full blown. We're unaware of the emotion while it's just an ember. By the time we smell the burning or feel the fire's heat, it's too late. We're, we're struck out and We've struck out in words or actions, or we're already on a binge. Here is a fairly common example of the life cycle of a klesha. You catch a glimpse of someone in the hallway, someone you have issues with. You experience a faint tension in your shoulders or a subtle tug in your chest. This is the ember stage. Next thing you know, you're having judgmental or resentful thoughts about the person. This stage is like when logs in a wood stove have caught fire. There's a lot more heat than at the ember stage, but at least it's still contained. Even this level may go unnoticed, but if you keep unconsciously escalating your storyline, it's as if you're pouring kerosene on the fire and it might even burn down your house. At that point, you and everyone else will notice, but it will be too late to prevent a great deal of unavoidable pain. The damaging text message has been written, you've already pressed send, and there's no way to take it back. So a lot of people, uh, the text message image is really clear and that's sadly that's how a lot of people conduct a lot of business in their life personal and and business even then there are ways of making the situation better and ways of making it worse 
at every moment and in every bardo, and bardo means transition, and in every bardo experience, we have these two basic alternatives. We can escalate or de-escalate our misery. We can strengthen unhelpful habits or ventilate them. We can strengthen unhelpful habits or ventilate them, let them go. By becoming more conscious of what's happening, we can put out the fire at the ember stage or the wood stove stage and save ourselves. Save ourselves and others so much grief. Having a regular meditation practice makes us more aware of what's happening in our mind, the mental undercurrent that tends to go unnoticed when we're caught up in our daily activities and interactions. With meditation, we begin to catch some of the ember-like thoughts and subtle emotions that left undetected detected, escalate before we notice them. Once we become conscious of the klesha, the next step is to let ourselves feel it, to feel what we're feeling. It sounds very simple, but for many people, this is quite challenging. Some people have difficulty because they've been traumatized. Others have certain emotions that for whatever reasons, they just don't want to face. But like all the other instructions in the Dhamma, feeling what you're feeling is a practice. There are ways to train in it, to make gradual process, progress. First, start with physical sensations because they're relatively straightforward and provide a good access point. How do you feel physically? When we're out of touch with our body and our, our clashes have a greater opportunity to run rampant. On the other hand, when we're present and embodied, it's easier to be in touch with our mind. So notice how your body is feeling, the aches and pains and itches, the sensations of heat and cold, the places where you feel tight or relaxed. And look at your state of mind. Is it discoursive or settled? What kind of mood are you in? What emotions do you notice? Here it's very important to have an attitude of curiosity and openness rather than judgment. Different things can come up when we allow ourselves to feel what we feel. We may have painful memories or intensely unpleasant emotions. That's to be expected and is no problem. But don't push too hard and make this into an endurance trial. The training should take place as much as possible in an atmosphere of acceptance. To grow in the ability to know what to do when an emotion grabs you, it's helpful to remember three words, embodied, present, and kind. Drop into your body, bring your attention to where you are right now, and be kind. When there's an upsurge of emotion, these three words can help you to de-escalate. The main instruction is to stay conscious. And as Sokhnyi Rinpoche has said, you have to be will willing to feel some discomfort. This is after all training for both life and for death, both, both of which are rarely painless. I've discovered over time that whenever I've allowed myself to feel what I feel, I become more patient with myself and more forgiving. Each time I find myself able to relax with the feeling a little longer. And here's the thing, while glaciers cause pain, the Klesha energy itself is a limitless source of creative power, like an electric current. It's not something you want to get rid of. The trick is to stay present with that energy without acting out or repressing. Doing this, or rather learning to do this, you might find out something remarkable. In the basic energy of the Klesha's, we find wisdom ungrasping, wait, ungrasp, ungraspable, egoless wisdom, 
free of grasping and fixation. That's in the basic energy of the Klaishas themselves. In the 70s, when I was being torn apart by Klaishas, I was told by almost every spiritual teacher I met to transcend the emotions, to go toward the light. But fortunately for me, I couldn't figure out to do it. I couldn't find a way to transcend. I longed to transcend and leave all those tumultuous feelings behind, but I couldn't. Then I received teachings from Trungpa Rinpoche about moving closer to the Klesha energy, and that changed my life. Oh, very powerful. I just want to reread what their definition of the clay, of clashes are, so that's not confusing if you miss that. Uh, clashes. The Dharma tells us that all our experiences of discomfort, anxiety, being disturbed, and being bothered are rooted in our clashes. The Sanskrit term ter, term means destructive emotions or pain-causing emotions. And that's when she explained the three destructive emotions, the three poisons, the three, the three headings for all these clashes become craving, aggression, and ignorance, or desire, uh, desire, anger, and ignorance, or delusion. So these are the same that we study. And the, the, the three main clashes are craving, aggression, and ignorance. So all of those disturbing emotions, it's, they're all, that energy is also the source of the most powerful uh, creative energy. Very good. I think, why don't we sit now? Let's see, we don't have much time, but I want to sit, I want you to sit, and I'm going to read these two paragraphs where she's talking about, um, this is how she says our meditation practice is how we break these. So, uh, this is similar to rain. It's a different description, but it's just like the uh, teaching that uh, Tara Brock writes about in Radical Compassion, and it's been around for a long time. And we work; we can work with this in meditation. We recognize what's rising up, that disturbing emotion maybe, or whatever, uh, sadness or whatever's rising up within us. Recognize it and accept it. No need to, to suppress it, just like she's saying. Don't suppress it because it's then the side the side products uh, of that repression and suppression that cause trouble. But recognize it, see it clearly, accept it, and then we uh, investigate. We're not thinking, we're not trying to fix it with thoughts, we're trying to investigate. And that's what she's talking about here. And then we come back to uh, nurturing ourselves or neutral. Uh, we, we, we do that for a while and then we we, we stop, we don't want to just, we don't want to go on and on. So let's sit and I'll read this, read the process that she gives. That'll help you remember it more. So close your eyes. Be in your meditation posture so your body knows you're awake. And that usually will mean let your back become your support and roll your shoulders back, feel that spine supporting you regardless of your where you're on the ground or sitting or what standing and walking and uh, then when you feel that awake feeling and that lifted up feeling then you can relax you're letting your spine do the supporting and uh, we don't want to slump because then we become drowsy and then it becomes painful after a while unless we just fall asleep. So this is, we're just going to do this for about five minutes. So close your eyes and just be aware of your breath and just listen to these words. 
first, start with physical sensations because they're relatively straightforward and provide a good access point. How do you feel physically? When we're out of touch with our body, our kleshas have a greater opportunity to run rampant. On the other hand, when we're present and embodied, as being in the moment, in this present moment, when we're present and embodied, it's easier to be in touch with our mind. So notice how your body is feeling. The aches and pains and itches, the sensations of heat and cold, the places where you feel tight or relaxed. Then look at your state of mind. Is it discursive or settled? What kind of mood are you in? What emotions do you notice? Here it's very important to have an attitude of curiosity and openness rather than judgment. Different things can come up when we allow ourselves to feel what we feel. We may have painful memories or intensely unpleasant emotions. That's to be expected and is no problem. But don't push too hard and make this into an endurance trial. The training should take place as much as possible in an atmosphere of acceptance. To grow in the ability to know what to do when an emotion grabs you, it's helpful to remember three words, embodied, present, and kind. Drop into your body, bring your attention to where you are right now, and be kind. When there's an upsurge of emotion, these three words can help you to de-escalate. Embodied, present, and kind. The main instruction is to stay conscious. And as one of, as her Rinpoche has said, you have to be willing to feel some discomfort. This is, after all, training for both life and for death, both of which are rarely pain, painless. I've discovered over time that whenever I've allowed myself to feel what I feel, I become more patient with myself and more forgiving. Each time I find myself able to relax with the feeling a little longer. The clay, remember that the Kalesha energy itself is a limitless source of creative power, like an electric current. It's not something you want to get rid of. The trick is to stay present with that energy without acting out or repressing. You may find out in the basic energy of the glaciers, we find wisdom, ungraspable, egoless wisdom, free of grasping and fixation. So thank you so much for being part of my practice and I hope you I hope you're enjoying Pema Children's beautiful book. I'll see you Tuesday. So thank you so much and remember may everything we do today our thoughts, our speech, our actions be done not only for our own benefit but for the benefit of all living beings everywhere. So have a beautiful day and good weekend.